everybody. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to our inaugural uh, celebration of the best projects in the northwest of uh, UK for the, for the IMA branch. Um, first of all, we're going to have uh, Olivia, who, who won the competition, and the title of her project was Automatic Identification of Alzheimer's Disease Patients Who Convert to Amnestic mild cognitive impairment uh, and she's from Liverpool John Moores University. Okay so over to you Olivia and I hope you enjoy the day. Thank you. So I'll just share my screen. If someone can let me know if they can definitely see that that'd be great. Yes yes we can see that. Perfect. Okay, so my name is Olivia Rand and I studied at the School of Computer Science and Mathematics at Liverpool John Moores University. I completed my Mathematics with Finance degree with a sandwich year in industry, during which I spent 10 months in the Credit Risk Department at the Berry Group. Since finishing university, I have returned to the company as a full-time member of staff as a Credit Risk Analyst on the Account Management team. And today I'm going to talk through my final year project on the automatic identification of Alzheimer's disease patients who will convert to mild cognitive impairment. So I will start with the background and motivation behind my project and then I'll go on to talk through the methods I used and the results I discovered and finally I'll conclude with my key findings. So I will refer to mild cognitive impairment as MCI throughout the course of this presentation. So despite having mild in its name, MCI is crucial to detect as it is a transitional phase between a state of normal cognition and Alzheimer's disease. So MCI branches into two forms, non-amnestic MCI and amnestic MCI with the latter describing the presence of a memory loss and therefore an indicator of Alzheimer's disease, which is irreversible after its onset. It's estimated that between 5% and 20% of over 65s have MCI, and dementia and Alzheimer's disease has been the leading cause of death among men and women in the UK since 2015. With this in mind, it's so important that we know how to detect which patients will make this transition early without the use of MRI, which would therefore reduce financial strain on the NHS whilst helping to address the problem. My intention was for my project to be a positive addition to the Alzheimer's disease research community as a prominent focus in this space is early intervention. I've personally witnessed the effects of Alzheimer's disease on the individual and their loved ones. And with having the skills to do so, I wanted to make a small help to the growing problem, particularly in memory of my now. And I was gonna achieve this using the following aim and objectives. So my aim was to find an automated method to identify which patients will convert from a state of normal cognition to amnestic MCI within a four year period from baseline using an appropriate data set. And I did this using the following three objectives. Firstly, I investigated what variables are useful to record on patients which generate the highest possible prognostic value. Secondly, I compared logistic regression and Cox proportional hazard regression and their prediction abilities. And finally, I found a suitable mathematical method to provide confidence intervals for accuracy. So what has already been done in this field? I performed a systematic search using PubMed using all different combinations of the keywords listed on the slide in bold. And I found only one published paper that looks at the same progression of interest to me by Lynn et al in 2018. This work trialed support vector machines, logistic regression, and random forest classifiers to predict conversion within four years from baseline to MCI, AMCI, and NAMCI. The other research I found focused on different progressions across the Alzheimer's disease continuum, predominantly patients who progress to MCI, 
to Alzheimer's disease. However, examining the normal cognition to MCI progression opens up the potential to improve early intervention effect, which is a hot topic for discussion among the Alzheimer's disease research communities. Some of the other research I used as inspiration for my project used survival analysis methods as not all patients experienced the event of interest. And the lack of research that looked at the transition from normal cognition to MCI highlighted the gap in this area and further supported my decision to look into it. So my data was sourced from the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center in Washington, USA, and it comes from an observational longitudinal study. The NACC Uniform Dataset launched in 2005 and the National Institute of Aging and National Institute of Health funded research centers contribute clinical evaluation data on Alzheimer's disease patients stored in long format database. I specified inclusion criteria to the NHS, the, sorry, the NACC, and the main criterion being that all patients were cognitively normal at baseline, and it contained 550 variables on almost 17,000 patients. The 14 variables I pre-selected took inspiration from published papers I'd read, and I also considered the type of information that this would bring to my model, which supported my decision. 11 of the variables were based on work I'd reviewed, which looked at the same progression of interest as my project, and I chose three additional variables to incorporate. These variables were sex, race and educ, which refers to the level of education that a participant received. I used complete data analysis to handle missing data by removing all patients with at least one missing value. Patterns of missingness were investigated for age and sex variables. For some variables, certain levels were underrepresented and so to tackle this, I created new groups which combined existing levels of race, speech, judgment and Cogstat variables to create new categories. And my primary focus was to determine individuals who convert to amnestic MCI within four years of baseline. So I performed data management and pre-processing to manipulate the data set, handle missing values, and ensure the variables had the correct structure. The flow diagram on the slide demonstrates the logic behind this process. I implemented logistic regression and Cox proportional hazard regression in R, for which I, I used model specific exclusion criteria, and I'll go into more detail on both of these methods during the next slides. I also used a data partition to randomly assign 80% of converters to AMCI and non-converters into a training and testing data set. And the performance of both models were assessed using area under the receiver operating characteristic curve and confidence intervals to ensure both methods were comparable. The 95% confidence intervals were constructed using the bootstrapping technique again, which I'll cover in more detail later on. So to begin with, I'll cover the first method that I implemented. Binary logistic regression uses discrete or continuous independent variables to estimate the likelihood of an event taking place. In my investigation, the logistic regression, patients with less than four years worth of data were excluded and my independent variables were the baseline characteristics of the subjects. So for context, logistic regression can be categorized as a generalized linear model where the logistic transformation relates to the linear component and this is expressed as the first of the three equations on the slide. The regression coefficients are obtained using maximum likelihood estimations, which operates by initially guessing the beta values and then adjusting in iterations to generate the optimal probability of the data being investigated. Although, in order for the results to be interpretable, the equation must be solved to find P, and this represents the probability that the event of interest will take place. 
And so to obtain this, the exponential function is applied, which generates the second equation shown. And then to the second equation, rules of logs, rearranging and simplifying all help to obtain the logistic regression equation, which is written and labeled at the bottom of the slide. Once the model parameters were established using the training data, predictions were produced on the test data. I used a Corky information criteria, which I will refer to as AIC, which measures the discrepancy between the true data, data generating mechanism and the data itself. It measures the quality of any given model. It, allow, it cannot be interpreted in isolation, but rather compared to other AIC values from nested models on the same data set. After pre-selecting variables, I used the automatic quantitative variable selection predictor in R, detecting all potential predictors as significant. The AIC value is used within the forward stepwise selection process in R, only allowing variables to be added into the model that reduce the AIC without drastically decreasing the overall quality of the model. So as I mentioned earlier, during my search for literature in a similar field, I discovered that some researchers had opted to use survival analysis methods in order to generate their predictions, which got me thinking about how I could do the same. So in survival analysis methods, when we do not have a definite survival time of patients, but some data of this is available, these patients must be accounted for, and this is called censoring. So to relate this back to the data that I used, patients could have either have been lost to follow up, they died, or simply the study ended before the event of interest took place. And this is re represented in the diagram shown on the slide by patients one, two, and three. So on the x-axis, we have calendar time, which indicates the years across which the study took place. And on the y-axis, we have the subjects participating in the study. Here, subject one entered the study when it started in 2005, left prior to the end and never experienced the event of interest while being monitored. Therefore, subject one was censored when leaving the study. Subject two entered the study in 2010 and experienced the event of interest in 2015. And finally, subject three entered the study in 2015 and didn't experience the event of interest before the study concluded in 2020 and was censored at the end of the study. For subjects one and three, we cannot confirm a definite survival time and we cannot confirm whether they experienced the event of interest while they, as they never did so while they were being observed and therefore these patients are censored. I used Kaplan-Meier analysis in order to visually represent times to conversion to AMCI, but also to display centering. Cox proportional hazard regression is a survival analysis method which operates by estimating a subject's hazard by modeling a vector of predictors. And the covariates in the model are what we call time independent meaning that the values do not change over time, which means that only one recorded value impacts the survival risk. So for this model, patients with a survival time of zero were eliminated. So the top equation is how we denote proportional hazard models in general. But the Cox proportional hazard regression model is the product of two functions and shown by the bottom equation. So the first of the two functions is called the baseline hazard function. And this is purely a function of time and is called as such because if all of the covariates in the model were equal to zero, or shall we say there were no covariates in the model, the exponential function would equal one. The second of the two functions is the exponential function. And this is pat particularly useful in the model as it forces the hazard estimates to be non-negative. 
The coefficients for Cox proportional hazard regression are also estimated using maximum likelihood estimations, but differs slightly from logistic regression in that it uses a partial likelihood function, which means it only directly examines the probabilities associated with those who experience the event of interest. In my case, those who convert to amnestic MCI. The Cox proportional hazard model was used to generate a risk score for each patient via a predict function in R on the test data set. So the flow diagram on the slide indicates the process which was used in order to carry out my investigation. I wanted to perform a model based prediction. So after data cleaning, I built models for logistic regression and Cox proportional hazard regression, which I've just explained the details of. Then I obtained a posterior probability of conversion to amnestic MCI within four years. And the final step was to determine a decision rule using the threshold, which is used to classify patients as converters or non-converters. I investigated the patterns of missingness and found that patients aged 74 and under have less missing data than those aged 75 and over. So missing data due to age was not completely random. However, besides this, no other patterns of missingness were found. For example, males and females had the same amount of missing data which was approximately 18% for the logistic regression population and 31% for the Cox proportional hazard regression population. Utilizing forward stepwise variable selection, 14 independent variables were elected to be in the model and these are listed on the slide in bold. Initially for logistic regression, all of the data was used to fit and test the model which generated an area under the receiver operating characteristic curve of 78.98%. Although this was prone to optimism bias, so I split the data into train and test data sets, and the model then generated an area under the receiver operating characteristic curve of 75.27%. As expected, the second AUROC point estimate from when both a train and test data set were used was lower and had a wider confidence interval than when the model was trained and tested on the same data. The 95% confidence intervals for each value are displayed on the slide. As I mentioned earlier, these were calculated using the bootstrapping technique. And this allowed me to understand how much variation there would be if my study were to be repeated. This involved trialing 50 different data splits, and I used this method predominantly because my data was not normally distributed. The diagram on the slide displays a Kaplan-Meier survival plot for the age variable. On the x-axis, we have time to conversion in years. And on the y-axis, we have the proportion of individuals who have not yet converted, but are still at risk. As we can see from the paler blue line sloping downwards, this indicates patients aged 72 and over, and shows that they have a faster conversion rate than those aged 71 and under. The increasing size between the two lines indicates that those aged 72 and over have a stronger probability of conversion than younger patients. And the log rank test was used to identify statistical difference between the curves of two groups. And this is what the p-value on the diagram represents. It's the result from the log rank, rank test. And that indicates that there is a significant difference between the two groups of different aged patients. The next diagram is another Kaplan-Meier survival curve, but this time this is for the sex variable, which again has time to conversion on the x-axis and proportion of individuals who have not yet converted but are still at risk on the y-axis. As you can see from the darker blue line in this diagram, it slopes down more rapidly 
and this represents male patients. The p-value again comes from the log rank test and represents that there is a significant difference between the two genders and males are more likely to develop AMCI than females. So Kaplan-Meier plots were generated for all of the remaining variables and the respective log rank test was carried out. And all of the variables were found to be significant besides race. The time-dependent rock was plotted from Cox proportional hazard regression. It was estimated at only three time points, one, four, and 12 years post baseline, as it was time consuming and the project was time restricted. The rock curve has time on the x-axis, which indicates years from a patient's first visit, and the corresponding area under the curve value on the y-axis. Strictly the four year time point and its confidence intervals are comparable to logistic regression, but the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve and confidence intervals were still constructed for the other two time points. The two methods provide very similar accuracy, just a drop of 3% for Cox proportional hazard regression. However, they have overlapping confidence intervals which indicates that the difference between the two methods is not significant. So what this means in terms of predicting conversion to AMCI within four years from baseline is that there's no significant difference between the two models. So among those who convert within four years from baseline, we can predict with 90% accuracy who will actually convert. And among those who will not convert within four years, we can predict with 46% accuracy who will not convert. But it is definitely more important in this scenario to capture the converters so we can intervene at the earliest opportunity. Logistic regression is a simpler technique, yet comparable to Cox proportional hazard regression for this data set which is why I have reported further accuracy metrics for the logistic regression model. This threshold obtains high sensitivity, which allows the model to be useful in a clinical screening setting. The testing data set has just 3.4% of converters, and this prevalence influences the positive and negative predictive values. So finally, on to the discussion to review my investigation as a whole. My logistic regression model achieved 75% accuracy, while the one relevant published paper by Lynn et al. in 2018 obtained 77% using machine learning methods. Therefore, my area under the curve is only slightly lower than that of the relevant published paper and it achieves this using inexpensive and non-invasive variables, which if proved can help to predict conversion, may encourage clinicians to record these values for patients as it will highlight that such information can be extremely useful for early detection and will reduce missing data. Strength of my study is also in the fact that I discovered two new risk factors, being male and older. Although no investigation comes without drawbacks. So as the patients voluntarily enter the study, my results are not generalizable to the overall Alzheimer's disease population, but strictly to the NACC data, which is described as selection bias. It's important to note because the application of my models to the alternative data sets may generate invalid results. Additionally, there was a minority of converters to AMCI within the data set, so this created imbalanced groups. The next step, if I wanted to implement this in practice, would be further testing to identify if the model can be utilized on the general Alzheimer's disease population. And last of all, it's two acknowledgements. So I would like to, like to thank the NACC for providing the data set for me to use during my investigation. Secondly, I would like to thank all of the maths department at LJMU for their support throughout the course of my degree. 
And finally, Therese Davies, a cognitive neurologist at the Walton Centre, for taking the time to share his experience and knowledge with me at the beginning of my project for me to gain a better understanding of the topic. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olivia. That was absolutely fantastic. Uh, I think we have a few minutes for questions. So if, you, if you'd like to ask a question, could you please unmute yourself and you can switch your camera on and feel free to ask Olivia a question. It's um, a webinar, so they won't be able to unmute themselves, but um, attendees can either pop a question in the chat or into the Q&A function. Okay, I think we've got one in the chat. Uh, yeah, so if anybody wants to ask a question, they can just pop, pop it into the chat and I'll, I'll read it out. And could I just ask you, Olivia, while we're waiting for other yeah. questions, uh, how come you had to get the data from America? Why couldn't you use some data from the UK? Um, I think it was like it was due to the format of the data and whether it was readily available. So there was a lot of data sets that we discovered that were from the UK that were either expensive to obtain or weren't publicly available. So we come across the data set from America and that seemed to fit exactly what we required for the project, really. Oh, fantastic. Right. Has anybody got, got a quick question? We've got time for one question. So we've got a question from Beth Jameson who said, um, if you could, would you like to progress this line of work? Are there any obvious next steps from your perspective? Yeah, so the next kind of steps that I'd like to take is I'd like to publish this dissertation. So I am going to look to progress that over the next sort of couple of months. Um, but if I wanted to implement it in practice, further testing would actually be required um, so that we can be sure whether the model is actually applicable to the general Alzheimer's disease population. Okay, thank, thank you, Olivia. I, I don't think it looks like we've got any other questions. Thank you so much. We, we hope you. you've really enjoyed it. Um, oh, so uh, we'll, we'll go on to our second speaker. So if, if you'd like to switch your camera off, Olivia, and, and if you mute yourself. And okay, Millie, you. Millie, are you able to unmute yourself and switch your camera on? I can unmute myself, but it won't let me start my video. Oh, here we go. Okay, so yeah, so we'll right. go over to our second speaker. So it's over to you, Millie, and your talk is on multifractals, financial maths, and the stock markets. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Firstly, hello and welcome to my presentation on multifractal analysis for financial time series. I'm Millie Tobin, previously a math student at MMU and a current master's student at the University of Manchester, uh, where I'm studying quantitative finance. Uh, this particular work has been supervised by Dr. Stephen Lynch. The contents of this talk mainly regard the analysis conducted by myself as a part of my final year dissertation project and concluding sentiments should hopefully summarize the work that's been entailed and suggest ways of moving forwards. So the aim of this project was to research thoroughly multifractal theory and its uses within finance um, at an objective to use MATLAB to obtain all multifractal spectra and then the subsequent use of such spectra for industry-based research, such as for the characterization of bacteria on surfaces and to divulge market behaviors. So what actually is fractal geometry? Fractal theory regards certain geometric objects which exist outside of Euclidean geometry, uh, that being the geometry of lines, spheres, and planes. According to Benoit Mandelbrot, this fractal geometry can also elucidate movements and patterns in the financial markets. And to quote them directly, the geometry that 
describes the shape of coastlines and the patterns of galaxies also elucidates how stock prices soar and plummet. So what is a fractal? A strict fractal object has non-integer dimension and is identical at different scales, also known as scale invariance. It's basically an image repeated at different levels of iteration or examination. And we can see that evidenced here in the Koch snowflake, one of the more famous examples of a fractal, which you might be familiar with. So what's different about a multifractal? Well, multifractal theory stems from fractals in real world systems where the idea of scale invariance doesn't quite hold. In reality, objects have different densities on different scales. And as a result, we need a continuous spectrum of densities to evaluate them properly. This spectrum of densities finds proper representation in what we call the F-alpha curve. The F-alpha curve tells us about the density, dispersion, and clustering present in the object or data in question. The F-alpha on, on the y-axis denotes dimension, and alpha on the x-axis is a measure like the Hurst exponent or the Holder exponent, and in time series relates to persistence. Um, F alpha curves have uses in both image and data analysis. This particular F alpha curve we can see on the screen is left skewed um, with a delta F greater than zero, which means we have a presence of clusters of gaps or dark pixels in the grayscale image. In financial literature, left skewing in an F alpha curve is thought to signal that the stem of the multifractality of the series is due to the presence of singular large outlier events. We can see here we have a large delta alpha, which means that the pixels are well dispersed in the image. So this is what a homogeneous or a symmetric F alpha curve um, and matching pixelated image look like. Um, we have a delta F equal to zero approximately, a relatively small delta alpha or alpha width, we can basically see if we were to zoom into one section of this image that it would pretty much look like the image as a whole at every level. So in that way, it's more close to a strict fractal. Here we have a right skewed F alpha curve. We can see that we've got a delta F less than zero. A negative delta F in images means we have a clustering of bright pixels. However, in related financial literature, a negative delta F can be attributed to, um, sorry, yeah. a negative delta F can be attributed to um, the presence of small outlier events, lots and lots of small outlier events contributing to multifractality. So the highest point on this curve tells us that the density of the fractal object um, sorry, what the density of the fractal object is. Um, here, we have a density equal to two, um, because in the image, we can see that the fractal covers the whole surface. Were the dotted tangent to the line indeed meets the F alpha curve, this is known as the information dimension, and it can tell us about the morphology of the fractal object under different levels of iteration. So earlier this year, I contributed to a journal paper on the retention of cockle bacteria to surfaces with a group of microbiologists from MMU. Using multifractal analysis, we could quantify how well dispersed different bacteria were across the different surfaces tested, as well as how they clustered together in groups. Shown is a binarized image, image of bacteria on a surface accompanied by its resultant F alpha curve and histogram. Right, the right skewing of the curve indicates that we have a clustering of bright pixels or cells rather than a clustering of gaps, which could be easily assumed from first glance at the image. Um, each bin in this histogram represents the frequency of the clustered area. So the title of this journal papers and the co-authors are shown. Uh, this particular paper is due for submission in antibiotics in January 2022. 
In this section, I will discuss the results of a rolling window multifractal analysis that I have performed upon two European indices. On screen, we can see the formation of F alpha curves as time progresses. So the research paper from which this section finds its foundation and much of its direction is called Dynamical Variety of Shapes in Financial Multifractality um, by a researcher called Stanislaw Drozds, uh, who has a lot of research relevant to multifractals. Um, the results of this study are shown here. Uh, we have a rolling window multifractal analysis or a timeline of F alpha curves for the NASDAQ over 50 years along with a bird's eye view of the same graph. We can also call that the values of alpha width against time. So here are the results of my rolling window multifractal analysis of the FTSE 100 and the Deutsche Aktien Index. In each case, multifractal spectra have been formed as a consequence to using the wavelet leader transform method, which is a method of multifractal analysis um, in MATLAB on around 180 14 year windows, each consisting of 3,540 data points, and then gradually graduated monthly through the 28 year period, um, where I've taken a month as being 20 trading days. The timeline begins on the 23rd of March, 1993, and ends on the 23rd of March, 2021. Therefore, obviously, uh, this needs updating with more with more recent data. But through that period, we've seen several major economic events, uh, those being the 1997 Asian financial crash, the 2000 dot com bubble burst, the 2008 financial crisis, the Eurozone debt crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic induced crash of 2020. So here are some alternative views of the rolling window multi rolling window F alpha curves for both indices. Uh, we can see here we've got significant changes, especially in the right side of the F alpha curves for the German index onward from around 2014. We can see that the F alpha curves here extend downwards quite widely in the alpha direction, but still a deep, steep descent towards um, F alpha values approaching zero. So we can see here the increase in width in the alpha direction shown does actually correlate in both cases with two crashes, that being 1997 and 2020. Now, current literature relates this alpha width measure or what we call, might call dispersion in image analysis to increased volatility in a time series. So that actually does align with those two crashes. So what we have here is a plot of alpha against time or the bird's eye view of the previous 3DF alpha curves for the FTSE. Uh, economic events that occurred throughout the period are shown to aid visualization. Naturally, the Eurozone debt crisis and the fallout of the 2008 financial crisis is not included because it couldn't really be assigned to one particular date. And here we've got the same graph, but for the Deutsche Aktien Index with the same uh, major economic events highlighted. So to better understand changes in asymmetry, delta F values are plotted here against time. The red circles indicate large increases in left-sided asymmetry. The blue circles show significant decreases in left skewing or a closeness to symmetry or right skewing in the case of the German index. In both cases, the red shows a shift, sorry, yeah, red and a shift to the left-sided asymmetry align with the Asian financial crash and the COVID 2020 crash. We can see that the FTSE 100 approaches symmetry or a zero delta F in 2012, and the DAX actually reaches negative delta F values or right-sided asymmetry just after in around 2014. Um, remembering that 
current literature is relating left-sided asymmetry or higher values of delta F to single large fluctuations contributing to multifractality and then right-sided asymmetry to smaller localized fluctuations causing multifractality in a series. What we can see here is a comparison of delta F and delta alpha values over the time period. We should recall here that delta alpha is, and dispersion is related to observed volatility. So this comparison highlights actually quite an interesting result. As we can see where the green circles fall, there's a very similar and seemingly major event occurring in both series. In 2012 for the FTSE and 2014 for the Deutsche Action Index, where delta alpha increases and delta F decreases hugely simultaneously. This is important because it means that at these moments, volatility spiked up, but so did the tendency for smaller localized fluctuations or lots of small events causing multifractality rather than large singular fluctuations or one-off major events. Hence, markets at this time are moving away from the impact of large singular events relevant to price. So to conclude, we've got the confirmation that multifractal spectra do indeed have the capacity to elucidate major economic events within the uh, financial time series data. There's also reason to hypothesize that left-sided asymmetry in financial F alpha curves could be an indicator specifically to any number of qualitative symptoms of market failure, such as inefficiency, illiquidity, or bubbling behavior. It is clear from the results that stock market crashes particularly are heralded by left-sided asymmetry and high delta F values. The continuation that we see of left skewing up until March 2021 shows us that at that time we were still in the midst of a crash. I'm suggesting also that the lenience of spectra to homogeneity and a small alpha width is a symptom of stability in a market and therefore liquidity. Finally, as we could see in the last slide, we had that moment in the FTSE and the DAX where volatility increased and small fluctuations increased what this actually means economically, I'm still investigating. But it's worth considering that volatility is known to spike when debt corrects in a market. So this would align with the fact that the Eurozone debt crisis was occurring on and before this period where this event occurred. So at the moment, aside from master's study, I'm completing a journal paper summarizing these findings co-authored by my supervisors, Dr. Stephen Lynch and Dr. John Borison. And that's due for submission um, early next year. It's important to note that public financial market data is very limited and very expensive. So the potential for real actionable macroeconomic insight from such results as these is limited also. Um, this research is interesting to me for many reasons, but currently especially so because philosophically it conflicts quite a lot with that of the teaching of my master's course in regards to the processes that govern price movements. Um, my current university module in stochastic calculus for finance considers price, price movements to follow a random process or a Brownian motion, albeit the very nature of this research suggests the exact opposite that prices are actually deterministic and hence are formed as a consequence of previous movements. So this has spurred me on to pursue similar research regarding fractional versions of stochastic processes uh, for prices for my master's dissertation. Uh, thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. My references from literature that's been mentioned throughout uh, is listed on the screen and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions now. Oh, thank you so much, Millie. That, that was absolutely fantastic. Uh, again, if, if delegates could put their hands, uh, their questions in the uh, Q&A box and, and I can read those out. Uh, and just while we're waiting, Millie, um, 
You're talking about um, other data that being being expensive. Uh, how expensive? And, and now you're working at University of Manchester. Are you able to access some of that data through the University of Manchester or through other universities? Well, interesting because I kind of thought that I would get to this course and just be met with a wealth of data. And that's not quite the case. Um, you have to... I'm pretty sure that they do have access to such data, but it seems like I might have to jump through quite a few hoops to be able to happen upon it. Um, it's it's something I need to look into, but it is not as straightforward as I might have thought. I, I mean, for me to access the data personally, I'd have to pay thousands of thousands of pounds. But um, And I'm sure that the uni has the resources, but I'm not sure that they quite exercise them if you see what I mean. So it's a, it's, it's, it's like a administrative problem, I'd say, trying to access that data. I think it'd be really interesting to see um, this analysis performed on high frequency data. That would be really interesting, but trying to access it is another thing. <laughs> so. Okay, uh, we don't appear to have any questions in the Q and A yet. So. I'll follow up with another question then. Um, what, what do you think the potential is for running this analysis on live data? You know, if, if you kind of, if you did it kind of by the hour rather yeah, than so if you could. kind of years? Um, yeah, that's very interesting. Well, it, it would basically, I mean, I've not actually hypothesized exactly what these changes actually mean. Uh, I've stipulated certain things, but basically it gives you a very good judge of the behavior of the market and um, engagement of um, parties involved in the market definitely at any given time. Therefore, as much as it is not quite an, like an interpretive method, which it definitely can be converted to, by the way, there is, um, I have seen research which would point to using multifractal analysis to be able to interpolate future time series. Not quite gone down that path yet, but um, there's definitely insights that it could provide for you if you are actively trading uh, on an exchange, definitely, I would say. It would take a while to set up, but it would be really, that would be very, very, a very cool thing. Fantastic. Okay, it doesn't look like we've got any more questions. Um... So I don't know, we might as well uh, open up. Olivia, would you like to come back and open up your mic and see if anyone's got any questions for either of you? Uh, I might just ask, ask you, have you both enjoyed the process? Definitely, yeah. Yeah, it's been Fun. great. It's been really interesting as well to listen to Millie's talk. Um, thank you, I know. Jordan, thank you. Um, because during the competition, we didn't actually get to see other people's um, talks did yeah. we so that's been really interesting to listen to tonight I really enjoyed that yeah it's definitely something that it's good practice it's like I'm not very familiar with presenting and stuff like that so it's good to get this type of experience I think it's enjoyable yeah. enough as well um, yeah and I completely it, agree in the future we, we probably you know but once we go back to normal and we can do face to face do you, do you think it for both of you it would be beneficial to run the competition face to face or hybrid or keep it online and, and what about you know if, if we do this again in the future we allow the the winners to present to the ima do, do you think it would be better to run it like live and we could record it or you know what, what's your feelings on that i mean face to face would make sense um it'd probably be more daunting for competitors but it's yeah. definitely good exposure i think that'd be a very good idea yeah, no, I definitely agree. I think face to face obviously is like a completely different setup. So I think, you know, it would be interesting to see, I suppose, how this would have materialized face to face. Yeah, definitely. Um, but I think it's definitely something that's worth the trial because obviously, you know, face to face is something that would have always been the case pre like pre COVID. So I definitely think that should be trialed at some point, a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, you should you should be, pr both be very proud of yourselves. You know, you're the inaugural winners of this competition. So that's something you both have in common. 
and I'm, I'm hoping you'll both keep in touch with each other. You're both given fantastic talks. You know, uh, you're, you're both very successful and hopefully this is the kind of thing you put on your CV and you'll be, both be pre very proud of it. And, you know, I think it's onwards and upwards for both of you. Both of you are, are amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, we'll have to connect on LinkedIn, I think. Oh, yes, no, definitely we will. We'll definitely keep in touch. Great. Fantastic.